Good morning and welcome to Delano United Methodist Church at Home. I'm Pastor Chad. It's great to have you joining us here for our October 11th version of Church at Home. Uh, we have a pretty simple service for you this morning. We're going to just give a one brief announcement. Uh, we have no baptisms or confirmations this, this week, which is the first time in some weeks that we haven't had something going on. But um, there is a lot going on behind the scenes and uh, we're all preparing for for fall and for the winter it's just been beautiful this last week and so i hope that you've had a chance to get outside and get some fresh air as uh, as we've had the opportunity <laughs> hopefully it'll last for another week or two it might be a long winter um so at any rate thank you for joining us uh we're I'm going to send it over to Christina. She's got a quick announcement, and then we're just going to jump right into our quiet time for our prayer and uh, scripture reading. So uh, we'll see you back here in a minute. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to take time to thank all of you again for your generous support of the ministries of Delano United Methodist Church. You know, for 150 years, as a community of faith, you have found a way to make miracles happen. And in this milestone year, I am really, really beyond grateful for the ways that you have found a way to keep your church in ministry and for the ways that you have been able to financially support the work of this church. I don't have enough ways to say thank you. So thank you for your generous, generous financial support this year that has allowed us to become church in a new way and to continue to stay together as a community of faith uh, when so much has changed. As many of you know, this is also a season where we spend some time discerning what our ministry goals and our plans are for 2021. And so this week, we mailed out some information about our annual giving drive and opportunities for giving for the upcoming year. And hopefully you got a mailing that had a few pieces of information in it, a cover letter, and information about ways to give, and uh, some of the celebration points about our ministry, as well as some of the things we're getting ready for next year. And I encourage all of you, uh, whether you're new to this community of faith or whether you have been a longtime member, to spend some time in prayer this month to give thanks for how God has been faithful through you and this church and to consider what kinds of commitments you may be able to make in the coming year uh, with the church. We do rely on your generous support we rely on your promises and your pledges. And so if you're in a place where you're able to make a commitment to the church, we would greatly appreciate uh, having you fill out a pledge card, either this paper card or fill out our electronic one and tell us what you might anticipate your giving to be in 2021 because that helps us be faithful to you as well to know what we feel like together we can prepare for ministry. Our hope and our goal as a community of faith is to have a fundraising goal of $200,000 for 2021. That is a slight decrease from this past year's fundraising goal. It is not because of a decrease in giving among our church family. You have been generous. You have gone beyond the call of duty. Uh, the adjustment is, to put it bluntly, to provide care and sensitivity for the ongoing struggles that families are facing because of this extended disruption due to COVID. And we want to make sure that as a community, we try and do something responsible that will allow us to do all the good we can with whatever we are given. And so, um, that's, that's it, plain and simple. If you are curious a little bit more about what some of the particular ministry goals or budget uh, numbers are, I encourage you to contact me or Yvonne in advance, or we have an annual meeting in November, on November 15th, and that will be an opportunity for everybody 
to discuss the next steps for our church and uh, how we want to engage in faithful, fruitful ministry in 2021. So uh, in this season of discernment and prayer and thanksgiving, I say thank you for your gifts. And I encourage you to take some time to discern how you'll be able to commit in the year ahead. And I know that God will do amazing things through all the gifts we share. And so I look forward to a year of faithfulness and a year of goodness with you. Thank you, friends, and God bless. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer on a beautiful autumn day. And we are reminded by everything that we see that change is a part of our life and of our world. Our lives, too, feel like they are in the midst of change. Our world seems to have gone sideways, and there's likely more difficulty and chaos to come. And many of the things that we are used to, the lives that we are used to living have been lost or, or put on hold, and we don't know to what end this will come. Perhaps our summer is over. But for someone who has never experienced the fall, it must be a frightening thing. It must seem that all the trees and, and many of the living things are, are dying and that all is lost. But you are the God of the fall and we are your people. We know what the fall means. We know that the winter is coming and we know what to do to prepare. We gather the harvest, we get our warm clothes out, we drain the water lines that are outside. <laughs> and for those who know what the fall means, it's just a sign. It's a sign for preparation for winter and that it is not the end. That we will not be afraid of the changes around us because you, Lord, are the God of the fall. And we are your people. Help us now to speak the truth, to love boldly, to be compassionate and forgiving toward one another through these difficult times. Help us to care for one another and to be patient through this long winter. You are the God of the fall, and we put our trust and hope in you, Lord, for we know just as surely that winter will fade and spring will come. We see this also in your son who lived and died and lived again. And we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh,
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24, verses 1 through 20. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told that David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there. And so Samuel went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe, and he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say that I am bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I didn't. I spared you, he said. I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. The word of God for the people of God. On Wednesday nights when I meet with our middle school students, sometimes I enjoy playing Bible games that test uh, students' knowledge of the Bible in ways that are un uh, not very traditional. Sometimes it is just a simple, fun icebreaker, like a would you rather, and I'll put two crazy Bible stories up and see you know, which one they'd rather have to be faced with just to get the conversations going. But sometimes I'll pose a Bible uh, game where I'll ask if they think it's in the Bible or maybe if it was uh, a scary story or if it was in the Bible or maybe it was something that Yoda said or if it was in the Bible or if it was something, you know, other kind of popular reference uh, to a story that might be unfolding day to day. I kind of feel like today's Bible story is one of those stories I'd probably have to pick if I were to do one of those crazy youth group games. Because let's face it, this is a weird story. A story that makes us go, is that really in the Bible and why is it in the Bible? And if you had just listened to the scripture reading, you hear a story about a king who's named Saul who is running around in the wilderness with 3,000 soldiers 
looking for one guy named David because he's trying to kill him. And when he is running around in the wilderness, hunting down David, he uh, needs to attend to his bodily needs. And so he takes a bathroom break in a cave. And of course, who is hiding in the cave? David with some buddies. And David's buddies, while they're in the dark, go, now's your chance to get rid of the guy that's trying to kill you. And what does David do? Well, Saul is indisposed. Instead of uh, winning and calling an end to this craziness, he cuts a piece of his robe and he hides back in the darkness. And then once Saul leaves the restroom and goes back to find his 3,000 guys, David pops out of the cave and goes, hey, guess what? I could have killed you while you were in here, but I didn't. And I have this piece of cloth to prove it. And what does Saul do? Oh, wow, you're such a better guy than I am. Okay, I'll stop and I won't try and kill you anymore. And that's the end of the story. Weird, right? And not only is it weird, but hopefully at this point you're saying, why are we even bothering talking about this scripture story this morning? When there's so much more in the Bible that we could be doing, why would you possibly pick such a bizarre pit stop, pun not intended, but now here kind of moment uh, to waste our time on a Sunday morning when we could be on to a different part of 1 Samuel? Well, my first answer to that is Chad set the scripture readings. That's what we were going to cover this week. And so you get my take on it. But a more serious answer is because I think that when we look at this strange, twisted scene, we have a chance to really unpack how moments of transformation and redemption can come in the most unlikely circumstances. So before I get to that, I would like to take a moment to set the scene for how did we get to such a strange, crazy place where one guy is racing around in the wilderness following 3,000, with 3,000 guys trying to look for one other guy, and suddenly, uh, just because of one simple act, it all ends. Here's how we got to now. In our story, we have been following the rise of Israel as a nation moving from a period where they were nomadic tribes and had judges to help them to a moment now where they have their first king. And in some of the previous scripture readings that we've covered this fall, we learned the moment in the Bible where the Israelites demand a king uh, of the prophet Samuel, and that's listed in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And then we also hear about Saul being anointed as the very first king. If you were to go back and reread part of 1 Samuel, you'll find in 1 Samuel 9 that Saul is introduced. And when he is introduced, he is introduced as a, a wonderful candidate. He is beautiful. He is great looking. He comes from an affluent family with connections. And it is said in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, no one in Israel was more handsome than Saul, and he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Of course, it meant he was tall, but in the Bible, it's also saying he really was considered great among them. And so Saul is anointed as their king. And the prophet Samuel is the one who anoints Saul when he turns 30. And it says in chapters 10 through 13 of 1 Samuel that uh, Saul becomes a king at age 30. He, his rule lasts for 42 years. And in the course of his kingship, he winds up uh, going to battle a lot, which is understandable. Historically, this is a place where Israel is trying to become a nation. They're trying to establish their territory and move from more than just being a tribe. And so there's a lot of skirmishes and battles and things like that. And we hear um, in 1 Samuel chapter 14 that Saul is especially at war a lot in the Philist with the Philistines. And we, of course, know a lot of those famous battles that he has to go up against. But the Bible is also clear to say not only was Saul at war because of his duties as a king, 
But Saul also emotionally and personally was at war a lot in his own soul. He had a temperament that was quick to anger and easily became jealous. And that kind of anger and jealousy really uh, became an ego problem for Saul and began to consume him and twist his ability to be king. And we hear in the writings of 1 Samuel that Saul struggles a lot then about being a good king. And he is often disobedient to what the prophet Samuel encourages him to do as a good king. And this eventually leads to a moment in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 27 through 29, where Saul has done something uh, once more in disobedience and to God. And Samuel confronts him about it. And Saul is so upset by what he does that in the pure raw emotion, because every, every emotion that Saul has is a big one, uh, he reaches out to the prophet Samuel and as he tries to beg forgiveness, he does so so vigorously that he grabs his robe, he pulls it toward himself and he rips Samuel's robe. And in that moment of begging for forgiveness, when this ripping happens, Samuel then tells Saul that this very ripping would foreshadow Saul's rule as king. And it says, just like the edge of his robe had been ripped, so too the Lord would rip the kingdom of Israel from Saul. And he will give it to a friend of yours, someone who is more worthy than you. And this is the prophecy that is then laid on Saul's heart, where he is told that the kingdom will be ripped from him, from a friend who is more worthy. And this prophecy drives Saul mad. And it he holds it for years and years. And he becomes paranoid. He becomes self-absorbed. And he becomes rageful. And his ego just gets out of control. And so it is in this context of Saul in his rage that David is then introduced. And of course, David comes on the scene first as a musician, and he is brought in into the court of Saul because he is very good at playing music, and the music that he plays is able to soothe Saul and help him to calm down. And so David plays this music and is helpful. And then, of course, we meet David then as a warrior. And there is that scene that Chad preached on just last week about David and Goliath. And this was the moment then that David is noted not only as his ability as a musician, not only as his ability as a musician, but as his abilities and capabilities as a warrior. And so once he defeats Goliath, he becomes this renowned, beloved figure. And he is kind of enlisted into the army and is loyal to Saul and fights for Saul. And he becomes extremely popular among the people. And in fact, he becomes so popular that there are songs written about David. And you can read it. It shows up a few times, but one time you can hear it is in 1 Samuel 18, verse 7. And there's this song that says, Saul has killed thousands but David has killed tens of thousands and women would sing this song in the streets about how wonderful David was and David this and David that. And this was not good for Saul because Saul wanted everything to be about Saul. And he becomes not only jealous of David, but he becomes afraid of David because what does he know? that the rest of them do not. He knows that prophet's prophecy from Samuel about someone more worthy than him who will rip the kingdom from him. And so his fear and his jealousy cause Saul to then place David in countless situations, uh, one after another, where he puts David in dangerous battle scenarios. 
And yet every time David is able to prevail. And this, of course, makes David more popular and it makes Saul even more angry. And the cycle just repeats. And several times, several times, it just goes on this and then this and this and this until finally Saul just cuts the charade and he actually has the gall as king to just simply go on a manhunt looking for David because he wants to kill him. And he uh, grabs those 3,000 men and he goes looking for David. And we have this uh, then narrative in the Bible where there is this pursuit and we see David escaping many different times because of friends that he has and allies that he has. And he has eventually a small band of, of buddies to help protect him. Uh, and that is exactly how we get to this point today where we have Saul hunting David and we have the scene in the cave. And of course, as I mentioned, while Saul is uh, looking for David with those 3,000 men, he takes the bathroom break. David, of course, knows there's 3,000 men out there to kill him. The king is right in there uh, who wants to kill him. He's got his buddies. He's got the upper hand. But he doesn't choose to respond with violence. He chooses to respond with mercy and forgiveness, and his action changes everything. Because David chooses to simply cut the cloth and confront Saul afterwards to say, look, I am not out to get you. I am not out to try and replace you as king. I have been loyal to you. Why can't we stop this? We do have for at least that brief moment where Saul kind of snaps out of it. And in the text, we have Saul saying that he, it says in the Bible, David, Saul says, David, my son, is that your voice? And he broke down in tears. It's like we hear, hear Saul getting out of his rage and out of his ego and finally glimpsing a moment of reality where he goes, oh my goodness, what have I been doing? And he looks at David. And as he cries, he says to David in verse 17, you are more righteous than I am because you have treated me generously but I have treated you terribly. Today, you told me the good you have done for me, how the Lord handed me over to you, but how you didn't kill me. When someone finds an enemy, do they send an enemy away in peace? May the Lord repay you with good for what you have done for me today. Now even I know that you will definitely become king and Israel's kingdom will flourish in your hands. And because of that, make a solemn pledge to me by the Lord that you won't kill off my descendants after I'm gone and you won't destroy my name from my family and lineage. And then David made a solemn pledge to Saul. And Saul went back home and David went to his fortress. It's really an extraordinary moment, isn't it? We have this time where even Saul comes to his senses and realizes this could have been game over for me and I would have deserved it. But David chose mercy and goodness. David chose kindness. And now even I realize that he is going to be the one to fulfill that prophecy Samuel said to me so many years ago. And it's time for me to stop the madness. It's really quite a powerful story. And as we reflect on this strange, strange Bible encounter, I want to leave you with three different perspectives about this moment in the Bible, about Saul and David, and how we can apply this to our own lives this day. The first perspective I wanna share with you is from Adam Hamilton. And he has an amazing series on the on David and his role as as king and warrior and poet 
And if you go to Church of the Resurrection and look up previous sermon series, be sure to check out their series on David from October 2018. In particular, uh, look up the, the October 14th, 2018 sermon. It's titled David the Warrior. And if you watch that series, you're able to actually see the archaeological footage of the, the settings that David was in, and you can get some perspective about the age of David and um, the, what the caves look like from our story today. All those components are there, um, and they're really fascinating. And what's also fascinating is the way that Adam Hamilton talks about this particular text. And he lifts up the point of how easy it is for us, like Saul, to be caught up in the dangers of jealousy and insecurities. And he points out that Saul is only thinking of himself and his reputation, right? That's what got us to this point of him hunting down David. And he is so consumed with himself. And yet, in the same point, we have a counterfoil. We have David who shows loyalty and integrity. And in the sermon, Hamilton asks us this question. How do we respond to our enemies and to those who persecute us? And how will we respond to evil? Will we be like Saul, thinking only of ourselves and our reputation? Or will we be like David, showing loyalty and integrity? Will we be a person like David who gives our enemy a chance to seek atonement and to show mercy? And Hamilton points out that we are not called to enable or allow for evil, but we are called to overcome evil with good. David demonstrates this in our scripture reading for today and it makes all the difference. He is the one who shows integrity and goodness and mercy, even in the midst of insanity. And this teaching, of course, is taught over again and again in our New Testament. It's full in Jesus' life and his wisdom teachings. It's filled of our New Testament epistles, especially if you were to um, pick out one in particular, if you were to reference Romans 13 which talks about overcoming evil with good. Just like this piece, He's, uh, Apostle Paul writes, it's like uh, lumping hot coals on your enemy's head when you overcome evil with good. Um, the point is that when we choose what is good, that is really the only way to overcome the evil around us. And that is why John Wesley's always was teaching to actively choose to do all the good you can in all the ways you can as often as you can. Because at the heart of it, it is only goodness that shows the way of love and that shows a constructive answer. Because goodness alone is the light that shines in the darkness and is a light that no darkness can overcome. And because goodness is embodied truth, and we know, as Jesus teaches us, that it is the truth that will set us free. And that leads then to my second perspective that I want us to think about as we uh, take in this piece of Saul and David's confrontation in the cave and the ripping of his robe. And it comes from Thomas Merton on a sermon that he gave in the 1960s on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And if you're interested in listening to the full sermon, I encourage you to contact me and I'll connect you to the audible recording that you can listen to in order to hear the full sermon. Now, in Merton's perspective, as we reflect on Saul and David and this dialogue between uh, being consumed with our ego and being filled with integrity. Merton lifts up uh, the teachings in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus says, no one lights a, a lamp and then hides it under a bushel. 
And that can be found in all three synoptic gospels, Luke in chapter 8, Matthew in chapter 5, or Mark in chapter 4. And he begins his dialogue basically on how I would summarize it as, what is your light source, right? When you are lighting your lamp, what is the source of your light? Is it your own ego-driven ideas? It is, is it you relying on the light of others? Or have you connected in with the very spark of God? Merton reflects that our work, of course, is to ignite that light and that spark of God within ourselves. And that when we do that work and when we do our ordinary tasks, our job is to kindle that divine light in an attempt to reconstruct paradise all around us. Now he notes, of course, we can construct a false paradise. We can create whatever we think and illusions we want. But at the heart, when we are in sync, with the light of the divine within us and let it shine, we become a shining light, a peaceful light, a light that can persist regardless of what is happening around us. And yet at the same time, he fully admits that the, there is a problem because with, we live in an age and I would argue it was even within the Bible's times, but he, want, he points this out of our more modern times. He says, in our lives, as we seek to be a shining light, we live within a great struggle between truth and power. And it's important to note that power in and of itself is not evil, but there is a great struggle between truth and and power, especially in the modern world. And he says, the main concern is that in the modern age, there is a great weakening of the sense of truth. And what has weakened it is the struggle for power. The unrestrained will to power, where will suppresses and changes truth instead of following truth. And he points out, that our will must follow truth, not a manufactured truth that follows our will. And he laments, but we live in an age when men manufacture their own truth. And what is important to them is not truth, but the favorable image. And he describes the favorable image as one that makes others wills go in the direction of your desired power. And that becomes the great struggle that we all face. And yet, in that struggle, we must remember that we follow someone who has already won, the one who is the truth. And as is questioned of Jesus, what is truth? Merton declares, truth is purity of heart. Purity of heart. And I would describe that as his internal, his original reference of having the divine light shine within us. And that being the main light that guides all things. Because as he writes and said, the universe is our body and we have a choice to redeem or destroy it. But if man is true and man is pure, then man will be full of light and redeem the world. The way we use created things is how we will redeem created things, Merton spoke and the way we treat one another is how we will redeem one another. And so as I share these thoughts from Merton, 
I want us to hold on to that last component about the way we treat one another is how we will redeem one another. Because that is the transformational moment at the heart of it all, isn't it? With Saul and David. David chooses to overcome evil with good. And in so doing, he redeems not only his own life, but he redeems Saul and brings him to a moment of clarity. And he redeems the men around him. And it only causes David's light to shine even brighter. So as I think about Hamilton's sermon and Merton's sermon, and we reflect a little bit this day on what is truth and what is power and what is purity of heart, I want to leave us with this one closing story, a little bit more ordinary, to help you along your way. It's a story about Gandhi, and one day it is told that a mother came to speak with Gandhi and said to Gandhi, please tell my son to stop eating salt. And Gandhi calmly looked at the mother and said, come back one week with your son. But the mother was eager to oblige him left with the sun, and a week passed. As she returned and waited in line, when they approached, Gandhi simply looked at the sun and said, Don't eat salt. And the mother looked back at Gandhi and was a little bit exasperated and said, why didn't you just say that last week? To which Gandhi looked at the mother and replied, first, I had to give up salt. I think if I were to wrap up all of the strange twists and turns we've taken in this morning's scripture reading, it really does boil down to this once more. That before we are faced with those do or die moments, we have the opportunity to take our daily, mundane, ordinary moments and fill them with integrity. Because it is in the ordinary moments that God works most fully. It's in the moments that we heard when I preached a few weeks ago about Samuel speaking, uh, with God speaking to Samuel as a boy. It's about the things that Chad preached about last week where David had spent years doing mundane chores before he defeated Goliath. It's in those ordinary moments, in the daily tasks, where we have the chance to be put back together and become something extraordinary. And often, that is really what integrity is all about. It's learning how to have our yes be yes. It's learning about be practicing what we preach and having the humility like Gandhi to have to give up salt before going to tell someone else to give up salt. And I encourage you this week to pick up and to take those small, unassuming moments in your life and use them as sacred touchstones, as opportunities for the truth to be ignited within, a, within that divine flame from deep within you. That is the work that will reclaim paradise. That is the work that will find redemption for your soul. That is the work that ultimately will help us redeem the world. And when the storms of life feel like they just rage all around us, we will find that we have a peace and a patience and a strength 
to say that it is well and that we too will have the wisdom to know that we can become a people where heaven and earth meet. And when we are in those moments of pressure, where our life is on the line, we know what is right. We know what is to be done because we have purity of heart and integrity and what is needed comes naturally. And that is how we change the world. And so friends, do not give up doing all the good you can. Do not grow weary. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is within you. Do not, light, do not hide your light under a bushel. Let it shine and know that God is with you. Amen. All right, friends, that's about it for us for this week. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am getting outside. It is beautiful out. So may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and your families. I hope to see you next week. God bless.